the case presented is done so with the informed consent of the treated patient. The patient is a 28-year-old female with metastatic alveolar sarcoma found to have Bilski grade 1C cord compression at T3. In light of rapid progression and an urgency to start her next line of therapy, we decided to perform spine lit with percutaneous stabilization across this level with the plan to operate through her current chemotherapy and to start spinal SRS and add a PD-L1 inhibitor within one to three weeks of surgery. The patient is brought to the operating room, intubated, and placed in the prone position on the MR-compatible table and padded. Phenodynes are placed and the patient is prophylaxed with antibiotics and dexamethasone. All procedures strictly adhere to MR safety guidelines, and you will notice our workflow is at this point to some degree limited by availability of MRI-compatible instrumentation, most notably spinous process navigation array attachment. Skin fiducials are placed in an easily decipherable pattern over the region of interest and marked. The reference array is surgically placed several levels away from the area to be treated and is covered with sterile draping. A flexible MRI coil is placed, taking care to avoid contact with the patient or navigation array, and the patient is brought into the MRI bore and scanned with T1 and T2 sequences for planning purposes. Next, the patient is removed from the MRI. With the patient outside the 5 Gauss line, a compatible sterile reference array is attached and the skin fiducials are used for co-registration with the navigation system, taking care to avoid skin retracting or depression. Accuracy of the co-registration is confirmed using superficial landmarks, including the skin as well as midline, and the fiducials that were used during co-registration. Image guidance is used to plan the ablation trajectories. In our experience, the diameter of the visual ace fiber is 2.7 millimeters, and the zone of ablation is approximately 12 millimeters. So partially overlapping trajectories are designed taking this into account. Ablations in the thoracic spine frequently span from superior to inferior end plate. In most cases, ventral epidural compression constrained by the posterior longitudinal ligament dictates the need for a relatively lateral approach, which can sometimes require a trans costovertebral or extraperdicular trajectory. We of course are cognizant not to violate the thoracic and retroperitoneal compartments. For non-eloquent root levels, for example in the thoracic spine, we have used transforaminal approaches to take advantage of the neurolytic properties of lit in patients with radiculopathy. In this case, two trajectories are planned on the patient's left and one on the right. Additionally, due to instability from a burst fracture at the index level, incisions for percutaneous instrumentation are planned using navigation. The patient is next prepped and draped in the usual manner. Stab incisions are made and a navigated jam sheet is inserted along the planned trajectory using spinal navigation. The accuracy of navigation can be confirmed when known anatomic landmarks, such as the spinous process and lamina, are encountered with the needle. The actual trajectory taken is saved into a plan, which is then superimposed on the navigation display as a roadmap for future trajectories. During surgery, we use fluoroscopy to assist with and confirm placement. The stylet is removed. If needed, foam hemostatic agents can be injected down the Jamashidi needle. The K-wire is then inserted. During insertion of the K-wire, it should be noted that both tumor and disease bone may offer little resistance.
A cannula is then exchanged over the K-wire. A titanium trocar is then inserted. This process is then repeated in sequence depending on the number of laser fibers planned. The navigation array and spinous process clamp are subsequently removed and the incision is packed so it is not closed in the event that it is needed later. The protruding cannula are draped in a sterile fashion and fenestrated MRI coils are placed. The MRI coils are then draped in preparation for placement of the laser fibers. Tamponading trocar is removed and the visualized laser fibers advance to depth. The sheath is withdrawn approximately 4 centimeters, exposing the tip of the fiber. An irrigation circuit is then connected to cool the fiber during the procedure. The remaining trocar is removed and a stylet is placed. For larger treatments with multiple ablations, we will frequently have a second laser fiber from the operative field for efficiency. The laser fiber can be readily distinguished on the MRI and its location is confirmed. MR thermography is then initiated, taking into account the patient's body temperature and with apnea during planning scans and thermography, strictly avoiding hypercapnia of greater than 45 millimeters of mercury using visual signals between the surgeon and anesthesiologist. We thermographically monitor the affected area in a plane collinear with the inserted fiber, including three points on the dural margin with a hard stop of 48 to 50 centigrade and one point close to the fiber with a hard stop of 90 centigrade, with measurements taken at 6 second intervals. Current software allows for integration of successive burn heat maps and the estimated required heat threshold to model total ablation area in a single map, and this can be superimposed over the modeled thermal damage from each individual treatment. In our experience, ablation is achieved after approximately 120 seconds of treatment time within the cylindrical treatment volume of approximately 12 mm diameter by a 15 mm tip length. The fiber can be retracted while the patient remains in the MR bore to treat more superficial areas within the corridor initially created by the jam sheet needle. Subsequent fibers are placed and treatment is performed along all cannulated trajectories. We have used up to nine tracks in a single patient to date. A final MRI is performed at the end of treatment including T2 as well as T1 pre and post contrast sequences to evaluate ablation and rule out cord injury.
Here are the intraoperative post-treatment images for this patient's ablation. The hypo-intense region corresponds to the area of ablation. At this point, percutaneous instrumentation, with or without cement augmentation, can be performed. Navigation would require re-registration using the previously marked fiducial locations, and we always use fluoroscopy to confirm locations, and in any case involving vertebroplasty to rule out extravertebral cement migration. The wounds are closed and dressed. We keep patients on a short steroid taper to prophylax against post-treatment tumor swelling and 24 hours of antibiotics against skin flora. Patients are ambulated on post-operative day one. We routinely obtain more comprehensive MR imaging in the days following surgery and often will obtain myelography if needed for spinal SRS treatment planning. Our outcome data has been previously published and references can be found here. Current efforts are focused on improving coil technology to improve workflow and on providing additional outcome data.